This is Chapter 3, Book 2 of A Journey in Other Worlds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. A Journey in Other Worlds. Book 2, Chapter 3 Heavenly Bodies. The following day, while in their observatory, they saw something not many miles ahead. They watched it for hours, and in fact all day, but notwithstanding their tremendous speed they came but little nearer. They say a stern chase is a long one, said Bear Warden, but that beats anything I have ever seen. After a while, however, they found they were nearer the time taken having been in part due to the deceptive distance, which was greater than they supposed. "'A comet!' exclaimed Cortland excitedly. "'We shall really be able to examine it near.' "'It's going in our direction,' said Errol, "'and at almost exactly our speed.' While the sun shone full upon it, they brought their camera into play, and again succeeded in photographing a heavenly body at close range. The nucleus, or head, was of course turned towards the sun, while the tail, which they could see faintly, preceded it as the comet was receding towards the cold and dark depths of space. The head was only a few miles in diameter, for it was a small comet, and was composed of grains and masses of stone and meteoric iron. Many of the grains were no larger than peas or mustard seeds. No mass was more than four feet in diameter, and all of them had very irregular shapes. The space between the particles was never less than one hundred times their masses. "'We can move about within it,' said Errol, as the Callisto entered the aggregation of particles and moved slowly forward among them. The windows in the dome, being made of toughened glass, set somewhat slantingly so as to deflect anything touching them, and having, moreover, the pressure of the inside air to sustain them, were fairly safe, while the windows in the sides and base were but little exposed. Whenever a large mass seemed dangerously near the glass, they applied an apergetic shock to it, and sent it kiting among its fellows. At these times the Callisto recoiled slightly also, the resulting motion in either being in inverse ratio to its weight. There was constant and incessant movement among the individual fragments, but it was not rotary nothing seemed to be revolving about anything else. All were moving, apparently swinging back and forth, but no collisions took place. When the separate particles got more than a certain distance apart, they reapproached one another, but when seemingly within about one hundred diameters of each other, they swung off in some other direction. The motion was like that of innumerable harp-strings, which may approach but never strike one another. After a time the Callisto seemed to become endowed with the same property that the fragments possessed, for it and they repelled one another, on a near approach after which nothing came very near. Much of the material was like slag from a furnace having evidently been partly fused. Whether this heat was the result of collision, or of its near approach to the sun at perihelion, they could not tell, though the latter explanation seemed most simple and probable. When at about the center of the nucleus they were in semi-darkness, not twilight, for any ray that succeeded in penetrating was dazzlingly brilliant, and the shadows, their own included, were inky black. As they approached the farther side, and the sunlight decreased, they found that a diffused luminosity pervaded everything. It was sufficiently bright 
to enable them to see the dark side of the meteoric masses, and, on emerging from the nucleus in total darkness, they found the shadow stretching thousands of miles before them into space. "'I now understand,' said Bearwarden, "'why stars of the sixth and seventh magnitude can be seen through thousands of miles of a comet's tail. It is simply because there is nothing in it. The reason any stars are obscured is because the light in the tail, however faint, is brighter than they, and that light is all the caudal appendage consists of, though what produces it, I confess, I am unable to explain. I also see why the tail always stretches away from the sun, because nearby it is overwhelmed by the more powerful light. In fact, I suspect it is principally in the comet's shadow that the tail is visible. It is strange that no one ever thought of that before, or that anyone feared the earth's passing through the tail of a comet. It is obvious to me, now, that if there were any material substance, any gas, however rarefied in this hair-like accompaniment, it would immediately fall to the comparatively heavy head, and surround that as a center. "'How, then,' asked Cortland, "'do you account for the spaces between those stones? However slight gravitation might be between some of the grains, if it existed at all, or was opposed by some other force, with sufficient time, and they have eternity, every comet would come together like a planet into one solid mass. Perhaps some similar force maintains gases in the distended tail, though I know of no such, or even any analogous manifestation on earth. If the law on which we have been brought up, that every atom in the universe attracts every other atom, were without exceptions or modifications, that comet could not continue to exist in its present form. Until we get some additional illustration, however, we shall be short of data with which to formulate any iconoclastic hypothesis. The source of light, I must admit, also puzzles me greatly. There is certainly no heat to which we can attribute it. Having gone beyond the fragments, they applied a strong repulsion charge to the comet, creating thereby a perfect whirlpool among its particles, and quickly left it. Half an hour later they again shut off the current, as the Callisto's speed was sufficient. For some time they had been in the belt of asteroids, but as yet they had seen none near. The morning following their experience with the comet, however, they went to their observatory after breakfast as usual, and, on pointing their glasses forward, espied a comparatively large body before them, a little to their right. "'That must be Pallas,' said Cortland, scrutinizing it closely. It was discovered by Olbers in 1802, and was the second asteroid found. Ceres having been the first in 1801. It has a diameter of about 300 miles, being one of the largest of these small planets. The most wonderful thing about it is the inclination of its orbit, 35 degrees, to the plane of the ecliptic, which means that at each revolution in its orbit it swings that much above and below the imaginary plane cutting the sun at its equator, from which the earth and other larger planets vary but little. This, no doubt, is due to the near approach and disturbing attraction of some large comet, or else it was flung above and below the ordinary plane in the catastrophe that we think befell the large planet that doubtless formerly existed, where we now find this swarm. You can see that its path makes a considerable angle to the plane of the ecliptic, and that it is now about crossing the line. 
It soon presented the phase of a half-moon, but the waviness of the straight line, as in the case of Venus and Mercury, showed that the size of the mountains must be tremendous compared with the mass of the body, some of them being obviously fifteen miles high. The intense blackness of the shadows, as on the moon, convinced them there was no trace of atmosphere. "'There being no air,' said Cortland, "'it is safe to assume there is no water, which helps to account for the great inequalities on the body's surface, since the mountains will seem higher when surrounded by dry ocean bottom than they would if water came halfway up their sides. Undoubtedly, however, the main cause of their height is the slight effect of gravitation on an asteroid, and the fact that the shrinking of the interior and consequent folding of the crust in ridges may have continued for a time after there was no longer water on the surface to cut them down. The temperature and condition of a body, continued Cortland, seem to depend entirely on its size. In the sun we have an incandescent, gaseous star, though its spots and the color of its rays show that it is becoming aged, or, to be more accurate, advanced in its evolutionary development. Then comes a great jump, for Jupiter has but about one fourteen hundredth of the mass of the sun, and we expect to find on it a firm crust, and that the planet itself is at about the fourth or fifth period of development, described by Moses as days. Saturn is doubtless somewhat more advanced. The earth we know has been habitable many hundreds of thousands or millions of years, though three-fourths of its surface is still covered by water. In Mars we see a further step, three-fourths of its surface being land. In Mercury, could we study it better, or in the larger satellites of Jupiter or Saturn, we might find a stepping stone from Mars to the moon, perhaps with no water, but still having air and being habitable in all other respects. In our own satellite we see a world that has died, though its death from an astronomical point of view is comparatively recent, while this little palace has been dead longer being probably chilled through and through. From this I conclude that all bodies in the solar system had one genesis, and were part of the same nebulous mass. But this does not include the other systems and nebulae, for compared with them our sun, as we have seen, is itself advanced and small beside such stars as Sirius, having diameters of twelve million miles. As they left Pallas between themselves and the sun, it became a crescent, and finally disappeared. Two days later they sighted another asteroid exactly ahead. They examined it closely, and concluded it must be Hilda, put down in the astronomies as number 153, and having almost the greatest mean distance of any of these small bodies from the sun when they were so near that the disk was plainly visible to the unaided eye, Hilda passed between them and Jupiter, eclipsing it. To their surprise the light was not instantly shut off, as when the moon occults a star, but there was evident refraction. "'By George,' said Bearwarden, "'here is an asteroid that has an atmosphere.' There was no mistaking it. They soon discovered a small ice cap at one pole, and then made out oceans and continents, with mountains, forests, rivers, and green fields. The sight lasted but a few moments before they swept by, but they secured several photographs and carried a vivid impression in their minds. Hilda appeared to be about two hundred miles in diameter. How do you account for that living world? Bearwarden asked Cortland, on your theory of size and longevity. There are two explanations, replied Cortland. 
if the theory, as I still believe, is correct. Hilda has either been brought to this system from some other less matured in the train of a comet, and been captured by the immense power of Jupiter, which might account for the eccentricity of its orbit, or some accident has happened to rejuvenate it here. A collision with another minor planet moving in an orbit that crossed its own, or with the head of a large comet, would have reconverted it into a star, perhaps after it had long been cold. A comet may first have so changed the course of one of two small bodies as to make them collide. This seems to me the most plausible theory. Over a hundred years ago the English astronomer Chambers wrote of having found traces of atmosphere in some of the minor planets, but it was generally thought he was mistaken. One reason we know so little about this great swarm of minor planets is that till recently none of them showed a disk to the telescope. Inasmuch as only their light was visible, they were indistinguishable from stars except by their slow motion. A hundred years ago only three hundred and fifty had been discovered. Our photographic star charts have since then shown the number recorded to exceed one thousand. This is the end of chapter three in book two of A Journey in Other Worlds. Recording by Tom Weiss. This is chapter four, book two of A Journey in Other Worlds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. A Journey in Other Worlds, Book Two, Chapter Four. Preparing to Alight. That afternoon, Ayrault brought out some statistical tables he had compiled from a great number of books, and also a diagram of the comparative sizes of the planets. I have been not a little puzzled at the discrepancies between even the best authors, he said, scarcely any two being exactly alike, while every decade has seen accepted theories radically changed. Saying which, he spread out the result of his labors, which the three friends then studied. You see, Errol explained, on Jupiter we shall need our apergetic outfits to enable us to make long marches, while on Saturn they will not be necessary, the increase in our weight as a result of that planet's size being considerably less than the usual load carried by the Roman soldier. I do not imagine, said Cortland, we should long be troubled by gravitation without our apergetic outfits even on Jupiter, for though our weight will be more than doubled, we can take off one quarter of the whole by remaining near the equator their rapid rotation having apparently been given providentially to all the large planets. Nature will adapt herself to this change, as to all others, very readily. Although the reclamation of the vast areas of the North American Arctic archipelago, Alaska, Siberia, and the Antarctic Wilkes Land, from the death grip of ice in which they have been held will relieve the pressure of population for another century, at the end of that time it will surely be felt again. It is therefore a consolation to feel that the mighty planets Jupiter and Saturn, which we are coming to look upon as our heritage, will not crush the life out of any human beings by their own weight that may alight upon them. Before going to bed that evening they decided to be up early the next day, to study Jupiter, which was already a brilliant object. The following morning, on awakening, they went at once to their observatory, and found that Jupiter's disk was plainly visible to the naked eye, and before night it seemed as large as the full moon. They then prepared to check the Callisto's headlong speed, which Jupiter's attraction was beginning to increase. When about two million miles from the great planet, which was considerably on their left, they espied Callisto ahead 
and slightly on the right, as deep waters had calculated it would be. Applying a mild repulsion to this, which was itself quite a world, with its diameter of over three thousand miles, though evidently as cold and dead as the earth's old moon, they retarded their forward rush, knowing that the resulting motion towards Jupiter would be helped by the giant's pull. Wishing to be in good condition for their landing, they divided the remainder of the night into watches, two going to sleep at a time, the man on duty standing by to control the course and to get photographic negatives, on which, when they were developed, they found two crescent-shaped continents, a speckled region, and a number of islands. By 7 a.m., according to Eastern Standard Time, they were but fifty thousand miles from Jupiter's surface, the gigantic globe filling nearly one side of the sky. In preparation for a sally they got their guns and accoutrements ready, and then gave a parting glance at the car. Their charge of electricity for developing the repulsion seemed scarcely touched, and they had still an abundant supply of oxygen and provisions. The barometer registered twenty-nine inches, showing that they had not lost much air in the numerous openings of the vestibule. The pressure was about what would be found at an altitude of a few hundred feet, part of the rarefaction being no doubt due to the fact that they did not close the windows until at a considerable height above Van Cortland Park. They saw they should alight in a longitude on which the sun had just risen, the rocky tops of the great mountains shining like helmets in its rays. Soon they felt a sharp checking of their forward motion, and saw, from the changed appearance of the stars and the sun, that they had entered the atmosphere of their new home. Not even did Columbus, standing at the prow of the Santa Maria, with the new world before him, feel the exultation and delight experienced by these latter-day explorers of the twenty-first century. Their first adventures on landing the reader already knows. This is the end of Chapter 4 in Book 2 of A Journey in Other Worlds. Recording by Tom Weiss This is Chapter 5, Book 2 of A Journey in Other Worlds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. A Journey in Other Worlds, Book 2, Chapter 5 Exploration and Excitement. When they awoke, the flowers were singing with the volume of a cathedral organ, the chant rising from all around them, and the sun was already above the horizon. Finding a deep natural spring, in which the water was at about blood heat, they prepared for breakfast by taking a bath, and then found they had brought nothing to eat. "'It was stupid of us not to think of it,' said Bearwarden. "'Yet it will be too much out of our way to return to the Callisto.' "'We have two rifles and a gun,' said Errol, "'and have also plenty of water and wood for a fire. "'All we need is game.' "'The old excuse that it has already been shot out "'cannot hold here,' said Cortland. "'Seeing that we have neither wings nor pneumatic legs, "'and not knowing the advantage given us by our rifles,' "'added Bearwarden, "'it should not be shy either.' So far, he continued, we have seen nothing edible, though just now we should not be too particular, but near a spring like this that kind must exist. The question is, said the professor, whether the game like warm water. If we can follow this stream till it has been on the surface for some time, or till it spreads out, we shall doubtless find a huntsman's paradise. 
"'A bright idea,' said Fairwarden. "'Let's have our guns ready, and, as old Deepwaters would say, keep our weather eye open.' The stream flowed off in a southeasterly direction, so that by following it they went towards the volcanoes. "'It is hard to realize,' said the professor, "'that those mountains must be several hundred miles away, for the reason that they are almost entirely above the horizon. This apparent flatness and wide range of vision is, of course, the result of Jupiter's vast size. With sufficiently keen sight, or aided by a good glass, there is no reason why one should not see at least five hundred miles with but a slight elevation. It is surprising, said Errol, that in what is evidently Jupiter's Carboniferous period the atmosphere should be so clear. Our idea has been that at that time on Earth the air was heavy and dense. So it was, and doubtless is here, replied Cortland, but you must remember that both those qualities would be given it by carbonic acid gas which is entirely invisible and transparent. No gas that would be likely to remain in the air would interfere with sight. Water vapor is the only thing that could, and though the crust of this planet, even near the surface, is still hot, the sun being so distant, the vapor would not be raised much. By avoiding low places near hot springs, we shall doubtless have very nearly as clear an atmosphere as on earth. What does surprise me is the ease with which we can breathe. I can account for it only by supposing that, the Carboniferous period being already well advanced, most of the carbonic acid is already locked up in the forests or in Jupiter's coal beds. How? asked Bearwarden. Do you account for the great red spot that appeared here in 1878, lasted several years, and then gradually faded? It was taken as unmistakable evidence that Jupiter's atmosphere was filled with impenetrable banks of cloud. In fact, you remember many of the old books said we had probably never seen the surface. That has puzzled me very much, replied Cortland, but I never believed the explanation then given was correct. The Carboniferous period is essentially one of great forest growth, so there would be nothing out of the way in supposing the spot, notwithstanding its length of twenty-seven thousand miles and its breadth of eight thousand miles, to have been forest. It occurred in what would correspond to the temperate region on Earth. Now, though the axis of this planet is practically straight, the winds, of course, change their direction, and so the temperature does vary from day to day. What is more probable than that, owing perhaps to a prolonged norther or cold spell, a long strip of forest lying near the frost line was brought a few degrees below it so that the leaves change their colors as they do on earth? It would, it seems to me, be enough to give the surface a distinct color, and the fact that the spot's greatest length was east and west, or along the lines of latitude, so that the whole of that region might have been exposed to the same conditions of temperature, strengthens this hypothesis. The strongest objection is that the spot is said to have moved, but the motion, five seconds, was so slight that it might easily have been an error in observation, or the first area affected by the cold may have been enlarged on one side. It seems to me that the stability the spot did have would make the cloud theory impossible on Earth, and much more so here with the far more rapid rotation and more violent winds. It may also have been a cloud of smoke from a volcano in eruption, 
such as we saw on our arrival, though it is doubtful whether in that case it would have remained nearly stationary while going through its greatest intensity and fading, which would look as though the turned leaves had fallen off and been gradually replaced by new ones. And in addition to this, the spot, since it was first noticed, has never entirely disappeared, which might mean a volcanic region constantly emitting smoke, or that the surface, doubtless from some covering whose color can change, is normally of a different shade from the surrounding region. In any case, we have as yet seen nothing that would indicate a permanently clouded atmosphere. Though they had walked a considerable distance, the water was not much cooled, and though the stream's descent was so slight that on earth its current would have been very slow, here it rushed along like a mountain torrent, the reason, of course, being that a given amount of water on Jupiter would depress a spring balance 2.55 times as much as on the earth. It is strange, said Ayrault, that, notwithstanding its great speed, the water remains so hot you would think its motion would cool it. So it does, answered the professor. It, of course, cools considerably more in a given period, as, for instance, one minute, than if it were moving more slowly, but on account of its speed it has been exposed to the air but a very short time since leaving the spring. Just before them the spring now widened into a narrow lake, which they could see was straight for some distance. The fact is, said Bearwarden, this water seems in such haste to reach the ocean that it turns neither to right nor to left, and does not even seem to wish to widen out. As the huge ferns and palms grew to the water's edge, they concluded the best way to traverse the lake would be on a raft. Accordingly, choosing a large overhanging palm, Bearwarden and Errol fired each an explosive ball into its trunk, about eighteen inches from the ground. One round was enough to put it in the water, each explosion removing several cubic feet of wood. By repeating this process on other trees, they soon had enough large timber for buoyancy, so that they had but to superimpose lighter cross logs and bind the whole together with pliable branches and creepers to form a substantial raft. The doctor climbed on, after which Bearwarden and Arolt cast off, having prepared long poles for navigating. With a little care, they kept their bark from catching on projecting roots, and as the stream continued to widen till it was about one hundred yards across, their work became easy. Carried along at a speed of two or three miles per hour, they now saw that the water and the banks they passed were literally alive with reptiles and all sorts of amphibious creatures, while winged lizards sailed from every overhanging branch into the water as they approached. They noticed also many birds similar to storks and cranes, about the size of ostriches, standing on logs in the water whose bills were provided with teeth. "'We might almost think we were on earth,' said Errol, from the looks of those storks standing on one leg with the other drawn up, were it not for their size. "'How do you suppose they defend themselves?' asked Bearwarden, from the snakes with which the water is filled. "'I suppose they can give a pretty good account of themselves,' replied Cortland, with those teeth. "'Besides, with only one leg exposed, there is but a very small object for a snake to strike at. For their number and size, I should say their struggle for existence was comparatively mild. Doubtless non-poisonous, or for that matter poisonous snakes, form a great part of their diet. 
On passing the bend in the lake, they noticed that the banks were slightly higher, while palms, pine trees, and rubber plants succeeded the ferns. In the distance they now heard a tremendous crashing, which grew louder as the seconds passed. It finally sounded like an earthquake. Involuntarily they held their breath and grasped their weapons. Finally, at some distance in the woods, they saw a dark mass moving rapidly and approaching the river obliquely. Palms and pine trees went down before it like straws, while its head was continually among the upper branches. As the monster neared the lake, the water at the edges quivered, showing how its weight shook the banks at each stride, while stumps and tree trunks on which it stepped were pressed out of sight into the ground. A general exodus of the other inhabitants from his line of march began. The moccasins slid into the water with a low splash, while the boa constrictors and the tree snakes moved off along the ground when they felt it tremble, and a number of night birds retreated into the denser woods with loud cries at being so rudely disturbed. The huge beast did not stop till he reached the bank, where he switched his tail, raised his proboscis, and sniffed the air uneasily, his height being fully thirty feet and his length about fifty. After seeing the raft and its occupants, he looked at them stupidly and threw back his head. "'He seems to be turning up his nose at us,' said Bearwarden. "'All the same, he will do well for breakfast.' As the creature moved, his chest struck a huge overhanging palm, tearing it off as though it had been a reed. Brushing it aside with his trunk, he was about to continue his march when two rifle reports rang out together, rousing the echoes and a number of birds that screeched loudly. This is the end of Chapter 5 in Book 2 of A Journey in Other Worlds, recording by Tom Weiss. This is Chapter 6, Book 2 of A Journey in Other Worlds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. A Journey in Other Worlds, Book Two, Chapter Six. Mastodon and Will of the Wisps. Bear Warden's bullet struck the mammoth in the shoulder, while Eralt's aim was farther back. As the balls exploded, a half barrelful of flesh and hide was shot from each, leaving two gaping holes. Instantly he rushed among the trees, making his course known for some time by his roars. As he turned, Bearwarden fired again, but the ball flew over him, blowing off the top of a tree. "'Now for the chase,' said Errol. "'There would be no excuse for losing him.' Quickly pushing their raft to shore and securing it to the bank, the three jumped off. Thanks to their rubber boots and galvanic outfits which automatically kept them charged, they were as spry as they would have been on earth. The ground all about them, and in a strip twelve feet wide where the mammoth had gone, was torn up and the vegetation trodden down. Following this trail, they struck back into the woods, where in places the gloom cast by the thick foliage was so dense that there was a mere twilight, startling as they went numbers of birds of gray and somber plumage, whose necks and heads and the sounds they uttered were so reptilian that the three terrestrials believed they must also possess poison fangs. "'The most highly developed things we have seen here,' said Bearwarden, "'are the flowers and fireflies, most of the birds and amphibians being simply loathsome. As they proceeded they found tracks of blood, which were rapidly attracting swarms of the reptile birds and snakes, which, however, as a rule, fled at their approach. "'I wonder what can have caused that mammoth to move so fast,' 
and to have seemed so ill at ease, said the doctor. His motive certainly was not thirst, for he did not approach the water in a direct line, neither did he drink on reaching it. One would think nothing short of an earthquake or a landslide could trouble him. There can be no landslide here, said Errol, for the country is too flat. And after yesterday's eruptions, added Bearwarden, it would seem as though the volcanoes could have scarcely enough steam left to make trouble. The blood tracks continuing to become fresher showed them that they were nearing the game, when suddenly the trail took a sharp turn to the right, even returning towards the lake. A little farther it took another sharp turn, then followed a series of doublings, while still farther the ground was completely denuded of trees, its torn-up and trampled condition, and the enormous amount of still warm blood showing how terrific a battle had just taken place. While they looked about they saw what appeared to be the trunk of a tree about four feet in diameter and six feet long, with a slight crook. On coming closer they recognized in it one of the four feet of the mammoth, cut as cleanly as though with a knife from the leg just above the ankle, and still warm. A little farther they found the huge trunk cut to slivers, and just beyond the body of the unfortunate beast with three of its feet gone, and the thick hide cut and slashed like so much paper. It still breathed, and Errol, who had a tender heart, sent an explosive ball into its skull, which ended its suffering. The three hunters then surveyed the scene. The largest and most powerful beast they had believed could exist lay before them dead, not from the bite of a snake or any other poison, but from mechanical injuries of which those they had inflicted formed but a very small part, and literally cut to pieces. I am curious to see the animal, said Cortland, capable of doing this, though nothing short of dynamite bombs would protect us from him. As he has not stopped to eat his victim, said Bearwarden, it is fair to suppose he is not carnivorous, and so must have had some other motive than hunger in making the attack. Unless we can suppose that our approach frightened him away, which with such power as he must possess seems unlikely. Let us see, he continued, parts of two legs remain unaccounted for. Perhaps on account of their shape he has been able the more easily to carry or roll them off for we know that elephant foot makes a capital dish. From the way you talk, said Cortland, one would suppose you attributed this to men. The Goliath we picture to ourselves would be a child compared to the man that could cut through these legs, though the necessity of believing him to have merely great size does not disprove his existence here. I think it probable we shall find this is the work of some animal with incisors of such power as it is difficult for us to conceive of. There is no indication here of teeth, said Bearwarden, each foot being taken off with a clean cut. Besides, we are coming to believe that man existed on earth during the greater part, if not the whole, of our Carboniferous period. We must reserve our decision pending further evidence said Cortland. I vote we take the heart, said Errol, and cook it, since otherwise the mammoth will be devoured before our eyes. While Bearwarden and Errol delved for this, Cortland, with some difficulty, parted the mammoth's lips and examined the teeth. From the conical projections on the molars, said he, this should be classed rather as a mastodon than a mammoth. When the huge heart was secured, Bearwarden arranged slices on sharpened sticks, while Errol set about starting a fire. He had to use Cortland's gun to clear the dry wood of snakes, which, attracted doubtless by the dead mastodon, came in such numbers that they covered the ground, while huge pterodactyls, 
more venomous-looking than the reptiles hovered about the opening above. Arranging a double line of electric wires in a circle about the mastodon and themselves, they sat down and did justice to the meal, with appetites that might have dismayed the waiting throng. Whenever a snake's head came in contact with one wire while his tail touched the other, he gave a spasmodic leap and fell back dead. If he happened to fall across the wires he immediately began to sizzle, a cloud of smoke arose, and he was reduced to ashes. "'Any time that we are short of mastodon or other good game,' said Ayrault, "'we need not hunger if we are not above grilled snake.' All laughed at this, and Bearwarden, drawing a whiskey flask from his pocket, passed it to his friends. "'When we rig our fishing tackle,' he continued, "'and have fresh fish for dinner, an entree of rattlesnake, roast mastodon for the piece de resistance, and begin the whole with turtle soup and clams, of which there must be plenty on the ocean beach, we shall want to stay here for the rest of our lives.' I suspect we shall have to, replied Errol, for we shall become so like Thanksgiving turkeys that the Callisto's door will be too small for us. While they sat and talked, the flowers and plants about them softly began their song, and, as a visual accompaniment, the fireflies they had not before noticed twinkled through the forest. My goodness! exclaimed Cortland. How time goes here! We started to get breakfast, and now it's growing dark. Hastily cutting some thick but tender slices from the mastodon, and impaling them with the remains of the heart on a sharpened stake, they took up the wires and the battery that had been supplying the current, and retraced their steps by the way they had come. Their rubber-lined cowhide boots protected them from all but the largest snakes and as these were, for the most part, already enjoying their gorge, they trampled with impunity on those that remained in their path. When they had covered about half the distance to the raft, a huge bow constrictor, which they had mistaken for a branch, fell upon Cortland, pinioning his arms and bearing him to the ground. Dropping their loads, Bearwarden and Errol threw themselves upon the monster with their hunting knives with such vim that in a few seconds it beat a hasty retreat, leaving, as it did so, a wake of phosphorescent light. "'Are you hurt?' asked Bearwarden, helping him up. "'Not in the least,' replied Cortland. "'What surprises me is that I am not. The weight of that boa constrictor would be very great on earth, and here I should think it would be simply crushing.' Groping their way through the rapidly growing darkness, they reached the raft without further adventure, and, once on the lake, had plenty of light. Two moons, one at three-quarters and the other full, shone brightly, while the water was alive with gymnotuses and other luminous creatures. Sitting and living upon the cross timbers, they looked up at the sky. The great bear and the north star had exactly the same relation to each other as when seen from the earth, while the other constellations and the Milky Way looked identically as when they had so often gazed at them before, and some idea of the immensity of space was conveyed to them. Here was no change, though they had traveled three hundred and eighty million miles. There was no more perceptible difference than if they had not moved a foot perhaps, they thought, to the telescopes, if there are any, among the stars the sun was seen to be accompanied by two small dark companions, for Jupiter and Saturn might be visible, or perhaps it seemed merely as a slightly variable star, in years when sunspots were numerous, or as the larger planets in their revolutions occasionally intercepted a part of its light. As they floated along they noticed a number of what they took to be will-o'-the-wisp. Several of these great globules of pale flame hovered about them in the air, 
near the surface of the water, and anon they rose till they hung above the trees, apparently having no forward or horizontal motion except when taken by the gentle breeze, merely sinking and rising. "'How pretty they are!' said Cortland, as he watched them. "'For bodies consisting of marsh gas they hold together wonderfully.' Presently one alighted on the water near them. It was considerably brighter than any glow-worm, and somewhat larger than an arc-lamp, being nearly three feet in diameter. It did not emit much light, but would itself have been visible from a considerable distance. Cortland tried to touch it with a raft pole, but could not reach far enough. Presently a large fish approached it, swimming near the surface of the water. When it was close to the jack-o'-lantern, or whatever it was, there was a splash, the fish turned up its white underside, and the breeze being away from the raft, the fireball and its victim slowly floated off together. There were frequently a dozen of these great globules in sight at once, rising and descending, the observers noticing one peculiarity, viz. that their brightness increased as they rose, and decreased as they sank. About two and a half hours after sunset, or midnight according to Jupiter time, they fell asleep, but about an hour later Cortland was awakened by a weight on his chest. Starting up he perceived a huge white-faced bat with its head but a few inches from his. Its outstretched wings were about eight feet across, and it fastened its sharp claws upon him. Seizing it by the throat he struggled violently. His companions, awakened by the noise, quickly came to his rescue, grasping him just as he was in danger of being dragged off the raft, and in another moment Bearwarden's knife had entered the creature's spine. "'This evidently belongs to the blood-sucking species,' said Cortland. "'I seem to be the target for all these beasts, and henceforth shall keep my eyes open at night.' As day would break in but little over an hour, they decided to remain awake, and they pushed the dead bat overboard, where it was soon devoured by fishes. A chill had come upon the air, and the incessant noise of the forms of life about them had in a measure ceased. Cortland passed around a box of quinine as a preventative against malaria, and again they lay back and looked at the stars. The most splendid sight in their sky now was Saturn. At the comparatively short distance this great planet was from them it cast a distinct shadow, its vast rings making it appear twice its real size. With the first glimmer of dawn the fireballs descended to the surface of the water and disappeared within it, their lights going out. With a suddenness to which the explorers were becoming accustomed the sun burst upon them, rising as perpendicularly as at the earth's equator, and more than twice as fast, having first tinged the sky with the most brilliant hues. The stream had left the forest and swamp, and was now flowing through open country between high banks. Pushing the raft ashore, they stepped off on the sand, and, warming up the remains of the mastodon's heart, ate a substantial breakfast. While washing their knives in the stream preparatory to leaving it, for they wished to return to the Callisto by completing the circle they had begun, they noticed a huge flat jellyfish in shallow water. It was so transparent that they could see the sandy bottom through it. As it seemed to be asleep, Bearwarden stirred up the water around it and poked it with a stick. The jellyfish first drew itself together till it touched the surface of the water, being nearly round, then it slowly left the stream and rose till it was wholly in the air, and notwithstanding the sunlight it emitted a faint glow. "'Ah!' exclaimed Bearwarden, "'here we have one of our jack-o'-lanterns. Let us see what it is going to do.' "'It is incomprehensible to me,' said Cortland how it maintains itself, for it has neither wings nor visible means of support. Yet 
as it was able to immerse itself in the stream, thereby displacing a volume of liquid equivalent to its bulk, it must be at least as heavy as water. The jellyfish remained poised in the air, until directly above them, when it began to descend. "'Stand from under!' cried Bearwarden, stepping back. "'I, for one, should not care to be touched.' The great soft mass came directly over the spot on which they had been standing, and stopped its descent about three feet from the ground, parallel to which it was slowly carried by the wind. A few yards off, in the direction in which it was moving, lay a long black snake asleep on the sand. When directly over its victim, the jelly globule again sank till it touched the middle of the reptile's back. The serpent immediately coiled itself in a knot, but was already dead. The jellyfish did not swallow, but completely surrounded its prey, and again rose in the air with the snake's black body clearly visible within it. "'Our will-of-the-wisp is prettier by night than by day,' said Bearwarden. "'I suggest that we investigate this further.' "'How?' asked Cortland. "'By destroying its life,' replied Bearwarden. "'Give it one barrel from your gun, doctor, and see if it can then defy gravitation.' Accordingly, Cortland took careful aim at the object, about twenty yards away, and fired. The main portion of the jellyfish, with the snake still in its embrace, sailed away, but many pounds of jelly fell to the ground. Most of this remained where it had fallen, but a few of the larger pieces showed a faint luminosity and rose again. "'You cannot kill that which is simply a mass of protoplasm,' said Cortland. "'Doubtless each of those pieces will form a new organism.' This proves that there are ramifications and developments of life which we never dreamed of. This is the end of Chapter 6 in Book 2 of A Journey in Other Worlds. Recording by Tom Weiss. This is Chapter 7, Book 2 of a journey in other worlds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. A Journey in Other Worlds, Book Two, Chapter Seven, An Unseen Hunter. They calculated that they had come ten or twelve miles from the place at which they built the raft, while the damp salt breeze blowing from the south showed them they were near the ocean. Concluding that large bodies of water must be very much alike on all planets, they decided to make for a range of hills due north and a few miles off, and to complete the circuit of the square in returning to the Callisto. The soft wet sand was covered with huge and curious tracks, doubtless made by creatures that had come to the stream during the night to drink and they noticed with satisfaction, as they set out, that the fresher ones led off in the direction in which they were going. For practice they blew off the heads of the boa constrictors as they hung from the trees, and of the other huge snakes that moved along the ground with explosive bullets in every thicket through which they passed, knowing that the game, never having been shot at, would not take fright at the noise. Sometimes they came upon great masses of snakes, intertwined and coiled like worms. In these cases Cortland brought his gun into play, raking them with duck shot to his heart's content. As the function of these reptiles, he explained, is to form a soil on which higher life may grow, we may as well help along their metamorphosis by artificial means. They were impressed by the tremendous cannon-like reports of their firearms, which they perceived at once resulted from the great density of the Jovian atmosphere. And this was also a considerable aid to them in making muscular exertion, for it had just the reverse effect of rarefied mountain air, 
and they seldom had to expand their lungs fully in order to breathe. The ground continued to be marked with very large footprints. Often the impressions were those of a biped like some huge bird, except that occasionally the creature had put down one or both forefeet, and a thick tail had evidently dragged nearly all the time it walked erect. Presently, coming to something they had taken for a large flat rock, they were surprised to see it move. It was about twelve feet wide by eighteen feet long, while its shell seemed at least a foot thick, and it was, of course, the largest turtle they had ever seen. Twenty-four people could dine at a table of this size with ease, said Bearwarden, while it would make soup for a regiment. I wonder if it belongs to the snapping or diamondback species. At this juncture the monster again moved. As it is heading in our direction, resumed Bearwarden, I vote we strike for a free pass and taking a run he sprang with his spiked boots upon the turtle shell and clambered upon the flat top which was about six feet from the ground. He was quickly followed by Errol, who was not much ahead of Cortland, for notwithstanding his fifty years the professor was very spry. The tortoise was almost the exact counterpart of the glyptodon asper that formerly existed on earth, and shambled along at a jerky gait about half as fast again as they could walk, and while it continued to go in their direction they were greatly pleased. They soon found that by dropping the butts of their rifles sharply and simultaneously on either side, just back of the head, they could direct their course by making their steed swerve away from the stamping. It is strange, said Errol, that, with the exception of the mastodon and this tortoise, we have seen none of the monsters that seem to appear at the close of the Carboniferous periods, although the ground is covered with their tracks. Probably we did not reach the grounds at the right time of day, replied Bearwarden. The large game doubtless stays in the woods and jungles till night. I fancy, said Cortland, we shall find representatives of all the species that once lived upon the earth. In the case of the singing flowers and the jack-o'-lantern jellyfish we have, in addition, seen developments the existence of which no scientist has ever before even suspected. Occasionally the tortoise stopped, whereupon they poked it from behind with their knives. It was a vicious-looking brute, and had a huge horny beak, with which it bit off young trees that stood in its way, as though they had been blades of grass. They were passing through a valley about half a mile wide, bordered on each side by woods, when Bearwarden suddenly exclaimed, Here we have it! And looking forward, they unexpectedly saw a head rise and remain poised about fifteen feet from the ground. It was a dinosaur, and belonged to the scaled or armored species. In a few moments another head appeared, and towered several feet above the first. The head was obviously reptilian, but had a beak similar to that of their tortoise. The hind legs were developed like those of a kangaroo, while the small rudimentary forepaws, which could be used as hands, or for going quadruped fashion, now hung down. The strong thick tail was evidently of great use to them when standing erect, by forming a sort of tripod. "'How I wish we could take a pair of those creatures with us when we return to the earth,' said Cortland. They would be trump cards, replied Bearwarden, in a zoological garden or a dime museum, and would take the wind out of the sails of all the other freaks. As they lay flat on the turtle's back, the monsters gazed at them unconcernedly, 
munching the palm-tree fruit so loudly that they could be heard a long distance. "'Having nothing to fear from a tortoise,' resumed Cortland, "'they may allow us to stalk them. We are, in their eyes, like hippocentaurs, except that we are part of a tortoise instead of part of a horse, or else they take us for a parasite or fibrous growth on the shell. They would not have much to fear from us, as we really are, replied Bearwarden, were it not for our explosive bullets. I am surprised, said Errol, that graminivorous animals should be so heavily armed as these, since there can be no great struggle in obtaining their food. From the looks of their jaws, replied Cortland, I should say they are omnivorous, and would doubtless prefer meat to what they are eating now. Something seems to have gone wrong with the animal creation hereabouts today. Their war horse clanked along like a badly rusted machine, approaching the dinosaurs obliquely. When only about fifty yards intervened, as the hunters were preparing to aim, their attention was diverted by a tremendous commotion in the woods on their left and somewhat ahead. With the crunching of dead branches and swaying of the trees, a drove of monsters made a hasty exit and sped across the open valley. Some showed only the tops of their backs above the long grass, while others shambled and leaped with their heads nearly thirty feet above the ground. The dinosaurs instantly dropped on all fours and joined in the flight, though at about half-minute intervals they rose on their hind legs and for a few seconds ran erect. The drove passed about half a mile before the travelers and made straight for the woods opposite, but hardly had the monsters been out of sight two minutes when they reappeared even more precipitately than before, and fled up the valley in the same direction as the tortoise. The animals here, said Bearwarden, behave as though they were going to catch a train. Only our friend beneath us seems superior to haste. I would give a good deal to know, said Cortland, what is pursuing those giants, and whether it is identical or similar to the mutilator of the mastodon. Nothing but abject terror could make them run like that. I have a well-formed idea, said Bearwarden, that a hunt is going on, with no doubt two parties, one in the woods on either side, and that the hunters may be on a scale commensurate with that of their victims. If the excitement is caused by men, replied Cortland, our exploration may turn out to be a far more difficult undertaking than we anticipated. But why, if there are men in those woods, do they not show themselves? For they could certainly keep pace with the game more easily in the open than among the trees. Because, replied Bearwarden, the men in the woods are doubtless the beaters, whose duty it is to drive the game into and up the valley, at the end of which the killing will be done. We may have a chance to see it, said Errol, or to take a hand, for we are traveling straight in that direction, and shall be able to give a good account ourselves if our rights are challenged. Why, asked Cortland, if the hunting parties that had been in our vicinity were only beaters, should they have mutilated the mastodon in such a way that it could not walk? And how were they able to take themselves off so quickly? For man, in his natural state, has never been a fast mover. I repeat, it will upset my theories if we find men. It was obvious to them that tortoises were not much troubled by the apparently general foe, for the specimen in which they were just then interested continued his course entirely unconcerned. Soon, however, he seemed to feel fatigued, for he drew his feet and head within his shell, which he tightly closed, and after that 
no poking or prodding had the desired effect. "'I suspect we must depend on Shank's mares for a time,' said Bearwarden cheerfully as they scrambled down. "'We can see now,' said Cortland, "'why our friend was so unconcerned, since he has but to draw himself within himself to become invulnerable to anything short of a stroke of lightning for no bird could have power enough to raise and drop him from a great height upon rocks, as the eagles do on earth. "'I suspect, if anxious for turtle soup,' said Bearwarden, "'we must attach a lightning rod, and wait for a thunderstorm to electrocute him.'" This is the end of Chapter 7 in Book 2 of A Journey in Other Worlds. Recording by Tom Weiss.